Welcome to Intro to Procedural Modeling Lesson 1. So in this lesson, we are going to cover just the basics of primitives and what we can do with those. We're going to take a look at their parameters and how we can start to create them uh, using the network view and the nodes that Houdini provides us. All right, so to get started, we are going to create a new geometry node. So I just hit tab over here in the network view and start typing in geometry. Now, if you aren't familiar with Houdini's um, user interface or how it works, I definitely recommend watching the Getting Cozy with Houdini course, also available on GameTutor.tv, as that will give you all the information you need to start navigating and uh, an understanding of what all the different windows do and just the basics of working with nodes themselves. Okay, so now we have our geometry container node right here. We can double click to jump into it. And as usual, we don't need that file node. All right, so let's start taking a look at some of the, the basic primitives that come with Houdini. So I'm gonna hit tab, and I'm gonna start to type out um, line. So a line is also a primitive inside of Houdini itself, and you can see it here. Let me actually switch over to my dark background so we can see it a little bit better. All right, so there we go. So we have our, our line in here, and currently, the line is pointing up and Y, you can see with our little um, origin gizmo down there, you can see that we're pointing straight up and Y. And that is because um, we are actually telling it to point in that direction. So this is X, Y, and Z right here for the direction. I can actually change that by typing in some other value. So now we're pointing in the X direction. So I can turn that grid back on. And you can see that we're pointing in that X direction now. And if I type in one in the Z direction, now we're pointing in Z. And you can also do the negative direction. So you just type in negative one, and now we're doing negative Z direction. All right, so let me actually put this back so it's pointing straight up in, in Y like that, uh, because I want to go over the origin. All right, so if I move the line up in its origin, up or down in the Y axis, we can move its starting point. All right, and again, with the X, I can move in the X direction or in the Z direction using the increment ladder right here. All right, so then the distance allows us to make that line longer or shorter. Okay. And we can also add more points to our particular line. And those, line, those points are distributed evenly, so even segments in the line no matter what the distance is. There we go. All right, so that is a line. All right, so now let's take a look at our circle. So let's type out circle, hit tab, start typing circle, and we'll turn on the blue display flag over here in circle. And now we have a few more options um, or parameters for this particular primitive type. Uh, what we can do is we can set it to a bunch of different types of geometry. So we have primitive, which is default for um, Houdini. We have polygon, <coughs> so that gives us real geometry, so edges and points and a face. All right, and we can do a nerves curve, or we can do a Bezier curve. And that way we have the pads and the handles and stuff like that. All right, so I'm just going to work with polygon currently, just to make it a little bit easier for us especially if you're coming from the game world. All right, so now we can set the orientation to different um, planes. So currently we have it on the XY plane, so it's XY, you can see down here. We can change that to the YZ plane. And we can lie it flat on the ground, like so. All right, we can increase the radius in both axes, so the X and the Y. We can again change its center so it's starting point, if you need to offset it. We can change the amount of divisions or points, basically, around that circle. And then finally, we can keep it open or closed. So we can do an open arc and adjust the, the values here for those arc angles to create just a half circle or maybe just a quarter of a circle. All right, so it allows you to do a lot of different things there. So I'll set this back to zero, and you can also change it from this direction as well, like so. So there we go, we have a closed arc, 
And now we can change that and create Pac-Man. Bam. That's pretty cool. And we can have a sliced arc, so we can actually add in the um, geometry that basically quadrant or um, triangulates the mesh. All right, so a bunch of different ways that we can actually um, utilize the circle primitive um, for our modeling needs. All right, so that's the circle. So then we're we need to go cover the um, grid. So let's take a look at the grid in here. So the grid is just like a plane um, inside of Maya or Max. Again, we have the different geometry types, and we can change it to just the rows. So you get just the just the lines for um, the rows, or just the lines for the columns. Okay, we can also change it back to rows and columns, and we just have the points. So no geometry, or no faces. We can tri triangulate it. We can set it to quadra qua sorry, quadrilaterals. And we can change it to alternating triangles there. And then finally, do it reversed. So I usually leave it at uh, quadrilaterals, like so. And also, just like the circle, we can change its planes. All right. We can change the size in both X and Y, like so. Again, we can change that center offset. So you start to see that there's um, a lot of similarities between the uh, different primitives inside of Houdini. And so I just wanted to roll through all these and just um, give a really basic overview of all the different types of basic primitives we have at our disposal because a lot of these models, these procedural models that we create inside of Houdini all start from these primitives. Okay, So that's the grid. And then we have the uh, box. So let's do a box. All right, and again, we have all the different geometry types. We can change its size and its offset center. All righty. So then we have sphere. And if you're curious, um, when you hit tab, you can just come down to the primitive menu option down here, and you can find all the different primitives. So really, sphere and tube are the last ones. So if we do sphere, again, we have all those geometry types. We have the radius. All right. And then we have, let's go to primitive, we have a tube. All right. And again, we have all those polygon types. We have the height, the center offset, the radius. And with this particular one, we can have, uh, we have a detail tab. And we, what we can do is we can uh, add the caps. If we have a polygon, we can change the rows and columns. All right. Allows us to create more detail there. And we have a torus. So the torus is basically just like in any other 3D package. We have detail torus. We have the basics, rows and columns, like so. And there you go. All right. So that's the torus. So now if you notice, if you go into the primitive menu here. We also have quite a, a few other different options here, but these are the ones that are basic to the modeling process. Okay, so that's why I just wanted to cover the different attributes or parameters for each one of these and just give you a quick overview of what all these primitive types can do. All right, so that basically completes this lesson, and we will now move on to lesson two. Thanks so much. <laughs>
transforming procedurally all works because it works largely based off of bounding boxes of objects. All right. Okay. So what I want to do is just cover uh, the basics first. So in order to transform an object, we actually need to utilize another node called the transform node. So I'm going to hit tab, start typing out transform and come in there and drop it down. We'll connect the box to the transform like that. And we'll come in there and now you'll notice that what we can do is we can start to adjust or modify the parameters of this transform node and we start to move that box around in space. We can also rotate it from here. Okay. Uh, we can do a lot of things um, with this. Now we can also uh, manually move the object um, with an actual gizmo here in the scene and to do that all you need to do is select your transform node come back over here into the scene view and hit enter. Once you do that the m translation or transform gizmo pops up for you so you can start to rotate and translate your objects. Okay, And then you have to hit the scale tool to actually go into scale mode like so. All right. So to get out of that mode we just hit escape and you'll notice that that transform node is still selected and all the values have been updated from our actual manual transformations that we did in the scene view over here. So really what I want to do is reset all this and instead of going through each one of these fields and typing it out what I can do is just um, go back to um, revert to defaults and that will center it all up and set it back to 000 and 111. All right so now that we've covered the manual way what we need to do is we need to be able to position these objects um, a little bit more procedurally or programmatically okay. So for instance let's say that I have another box over here and I want this box to always be sitting on top of this box. Well I could go in all right and hit enter and I could go and try to move this new box above the first box so box one all right but if I go and try to change the the size of box one box two doesn't follow. So I, what I wanted to do is I wanted to programmatically update its position as we go and change the, the dimensions of this particular box. So what we want to do is always snap it to the highest Y value that the box currently has. Alrighty. So <clears throat> what we can do is uh, a couple things first. Okay, so let's concentrate on box one. So in order to set up our uh, procedural placement or transformation, I want to uh, make sure that this box is actually sitting flat on the grid to start with. All right. And that just helps clean things up because I know the, the transformation is going to start from the world's center and our box is situated flat on that ground. Okay. So in order to do that, there is one way to start to move objects around procedurally. And this is utilizing the dollar Y min, dollar Y max, Z max, X max, and X min and Z min global variables. Now these are variables, <coughs> excuse me, that are built into Houdini itself. And all you have to do is just start to type them in. Okay. So what we want to do is have this box one sit flat on the grid. So all we do for the translate is type in dollar Y max. And now it's sitting flat on the grid. Now if I wanted it to actually be lower than the grid, but sitting flush with the grid, I could type in dollar Y min. And that'll make sure that it's below the grid. And we can do it for X as well. So we could say X max, dollar X max. And that puts it all the way over on its farthest X size. Okay, so I'm going to set this back to dollar Y min, or Y max, sorry. And then finally we could do dollar Z max. All right, so that's how we can start to move things procedurally. So we didn't actually manually move anything. All the parameters still update. Now what we're saying is that that box basically starts from those dimensions. And those are the sides, okay, of our cube. So basically this is, Z, this is X max, this is X min, okay? This is Z max, this is Z min. <clears throat> and when you type these values out, so if I type in dollar Y max, we're actually getting the proper translation amount. So what we can do is we can debug the value that's being sent us from this Y max by just single clicking, left clicking on this particular um, translate value over here. All right, and for some reason we're not getting any value. 
because it should be showing 1.5. So let's actually just increase this a little bit. And that is pretty funky. So let me actually put in dollar y min. Let's see what we get. We still get zero there. Well, there we go. There's the real value. All right. So basically, again, dollar y max will give you half, will give you that full y height. All right. So we just moved it up that full y height there. So let me actually reset my box to one. So we're all normalized there. All right. So now that we've got this box situated, let's do the same thing for this particular box over here. So again, what I want to do is type out dollar y max. And that will give me that 0.5 value because we start at zero, but we only have to move up 0.5, right? Because the current size of the box in y is one. So we get half that to move it up to on top of the grid. So now what I want to do is utilize another built-in function that Houdini comes with to make sure that this box is always sitting on top of box one. So box two is always going to be sitting on top of box one. So again, we need another transform node. So you can start to string these things together to create programmatic trans transformations. All right. So now what I want to do is I actually want to get the Y max from this particular transform because this is the box one transform. So I need to find out where it ended up at this particular node. So to do that, what we need to do is we're going to type in the function name of B bo B box basically. All right. And that stands for bounding box. So B box. And you'll notice that once you do that, we'll get this little help pop up. And this allows us to know what parameters we need or arguments we need to feed into this function in order for it to, to work. And you'll notice that it returns a float value. All right. In this case, it's going to return one for us because we are one unit up. All right. So in order to get out into this string surface node, because our surface node is this X form one, we need to place that into quotes because it's a string. Then we need two dots and a forward slash. And now we're outside of this particular node. And we can go and capture data from another node. So I'm going to just hit X form one. And then I want the Y max. So I hit D Y max. And that is the parameter that Houdini needs in order to know which direction you want to pick. So if we do that, we basically, basically have box two now sitting on top of box one. So if I merge these two guys together now with a merge node, just to verify, all right, and I change the uh, Y size of my box. You'll notice that box two is always sitting on top of that first box. All right, so that's the basic intro to uh, procedural transformations using just a couple of built-in uh, functions. All right, thanks so much. Welcome to Intro to Procedural Modeling, Lesson 3. In this particular lesson, what we're going to do is uh, start to take a look at how we can start to copy um, in a procedural way and create some variation using a copy node. All right. We're, so we're going to take a look at how all that works. So let's actually get rid of all this here. We don't need that anymore. And let's just make our box uh, one by one by one. So normalized box over here. All right. So basically what I want to do is I want to create a line of boxes. Um, that um, have some sort of property on them that allows them to step up in size as they uh, reach the end of a line, let's say. Okay, so let's do something like that. And so we're going to just first go through some of the basics of uh, copying um, throughout through that. All right, so let's create our line first and get that all set, set up. So for this particular line, um, I wanted to point it straight in the Z axis. So I just want to go positive one for the Z. All right. And we can make it a little bit longer just so we, we can create some more points. So I want to add some more points to that line as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to copy a box on each one of these points. But before we do that, let's actually take a look at some of the parameters in the copy node. So I'm going to hit tab, start typing out copy. 
All right, so you'll notice that the copy node is different than some of these primitives. All right, the primitives, some don't have any inputs, some do. Um, and that's just because they are primitive objects. So they are creating data, whereas the copy node is manipulating data, okay? So it has two inputs. Now, for any input in a node inside of Houdini, you can minimus click all over it and get a little bit more information about what that input is expecting, okay? So in this case, input one is expecting primitives to copy. That would be our box. That is the primitive that we want to copy over and over and over again. And the second input is the template to copy to. That would be the points on the line. So each one of these point, points is a template for it to copy to. So the copy node will run through each one of these points and make a copy of this particular box on each point as it rolls through. Okay, now the, the copy node doesn't necessarily need to have the input to filled in. Okay, so let's actually take a look. All right, we can actually copy just the, the primitive itself without any need for a template. You're just basically telling it that there is no template to copy to. But let's say I want to make five copies of this box. Well, where are the five copies of my box when I do that? Well, what needs to happen is you have to give it an offset Okay, so I'm going to give it an offset of 1.5 and Z. Okay, so what we can do is we can start to offset it. So that's the offset value. So every single time it copies, it goes another 1.5, another 1.5. And we can change that value dynamically. All right, we can create more copies. And we can also uh, increase the rotation. So let's rotate on the Y and do something like 10. So you'll notice now, the more copies I create, the more rotation is created. And we can also do things like scale. So let's scale it up in Y by 1.5. There we go. So now we have cell phone bars like that. Let's just do five for rotation. So now as I copy more and more, we'll just keep going up and up and up in kind of an exponential curve type thing. All right. All right, so that's the, the really basic use of the copy node. And honestly, I usually use uh, points to copy to. So that's how I mostly use the copy node. But I just wanted to show how you use the copy node straight up um, just so we can get comfortable with it. All right, so uh, the next uh, item on our list over here is to actually copy to the points. So let's not um, do anything with our copies and we're just gonna create a single copy and we're gonna leave our scale at one like that. All right, so now let's feed in these points into our copy line. So we have all these points over here and the points themselves have a number. All right, so we go from zero, one, two, three, four, five, Right, and that's just because we have six points and we start at zero. All right, so we have six points and we can increase that. All right, so if we feed in these points into that template or input two, okay, for the copy, we're gonna get a box at every single one of those points. And now what we can do is we can actually just increase the distance of the line and the boxes will go with it, all right? And so what's happening is, even though we only have a single number of copies, every single time that the copy node iterates through the next point or next template, it creates a single copy. So what we could do is we could create two copies on each one of these particular points. And we could offset it, let's not rotate it, but we can offset it 1.5 and X, so we get two boxes. All right, so we, we could say 1.5. Oops, that's Y. But that, copy is still based off of this first line. All right, and we can create more copies and it'll just keep going up and up and up. And all those boxes are gonna be affected. And we can create more points, create more boxes, less points, less boxes. All right, so you can start to see how you can combine all these different methods using this copy node, all right? So the other thing that uh, it becomes really, really useful is the ability to stamp. All right, and now that's not gonna make a bunch of sense to you right off the bat, 
But basically, um, what happens is we can actually increase some value by using the stamp tab right here. So that every single time a cube or one of these boxes gets duplicated or copied to one of these points, we can actually loop through and tell it to be a different size or a different rotation. Okay, so instead of doing this per se, right, because we just have one copy and the rotation is not going to do anything here because it works on the cumul cumulative number. All right. So what we, what we need to do is utilize the stamp value. All right, so let's go over that. So I'm going to go into the stamp tab. And in order for stamps to work at all, what we need to do is say stamp inputs. So that basically gets the loop going. So now what we're telling the hierarchy is that, hey, this is going to use stamps. So we're going to start feeding some values through this loop over here. So we're going to go up and come back down, then copy in the next one, go up, come back down. All right, so it's kind of a loop. All right, and so basically what we can do is we can bring in another global variable that is given to us by uh, Houdini, and that is the point number. Okay, so what we're going to say is $PT. So that's going to give us the current point number that this copy is on. All right, and so basically if we look at our point numbers here, what we can do is we can start to multiply our scale by this point number. So we can not multiply it by anything, multiply it by one, multiply it by two, and so on and so forth, because we're bringing in that point number right here. All right, so you can see that it's on five, and that's because we have six points. And the way that we actually can access this is by giving it a variable name. So I'm just going to call this point num. That's the variable name that allows us to access this value per copy as it rolls through each of the templates or each of the points in that copy node. All right, so how do we get this all to work? So I'm going to go up into the box size parameter and the Y specifically. I'm going to start typing out stamp. Okay. And then what we want to do is we want to give it uh, the uh, string, right, or the copy node that we want to pull from. So again, two dots to jump out of this particular node and select a node out in our network somewhere. And then it's looking for the actual variable name. Okay, so in this case, it's point num. And then we just need a default float value, which is zero in this case. Well, usually zero. So if I do that, you'll notice that my size now is pulling in that point number value. And so what we can do is I can start to modify and manip manipulate this single variable to create proceduralism in the way that we actually copy. And we're looping through this half of the, so all these nodes, so every single time we copy a new box, we come up and we give it the new point number or whatever value this equates to. So if I add one to it, we have our first initial box. So we get point number plus one, point number. So this would be one plus one is two. One plus two is three. One plus three is four, so on and so forth for as many points that there are on the line. So we can actually create proceduralism that way. All right. And that is how you use the copy node. That is the basics of the copy node and the many different ways that you can utilize its features in procedurally mo procedural modeling. Thanks so much. <laughs>
And now what I want to do here is I want to start to build in some procedural data. So I'm going to give the, the line um, a couple more points there. Let's make it a little bit longer so we can actually see it. And I don't really need the grid on for now. Okay, so we have here we have five points um, in a line. And now what we can do is we can drop down a point soft node. So I'm going to hit point. And we'll just turn on the blue display flag for that. And then let's take a look at all the parameters that we have available to us over here. All right, so basically we have um, the standard tab, our particle tab, our force, custom. And so we can set up custom attributes, all right? Really what we're mostly interested in this particular lesson is the standard tab. And what we can start to do is we can start to modify the position, okay, of each point as the points grow in value. We can give new color. Uh, we can give particular weights, okay? Uh, we can create a new alpha value, all right? We can also give it a new normal and start to apply UVs, okay? So I'm just gonna do a really basic overview of this uh, because some of the core things that we use over and over again are position, color, and normal. So I wanna make sure that we have a firm understanding of how to use those. All right, so <clears throat> what we can do is we can actually start to modify the positions of the points by adding on a certain value let's say to the, the uh, Y position. So if I add one to the Y position, you'll notice that all the points jumped up in space by one unit, okay? And that's just because I'm adding one onto the position. All right, so this dollar $TY value, okay? That's another built-in value. This is holding the point position, the Y position value of each of these points. The same goes for the X and the same goes for the z-axis. There we go. <clears throat> but one thing we can do is we can always um, actually increase this by, let's say, the uh, dollar $PT value. And what we get is a linear line. All right. And we can also uh, start to do math functions. So we could do something like, let's say, the power of dollar $PT and let's say a value of three for the exponent. And this starts to give us a curved line. And we can multiply that by um, 0 0.25 just to make it a little bit smaller so we can actually see it. So what we're doing is we're starting to build in some procedural values here. And you'll notice that I can create these curves, right? So I can actually bend the tip of, of this particular line here just by including a little bit of math here to augment that z position all right so we can actually apply that as well to the x position over here and now we have that going in the opposite direction or in the x direction all right so you can see how powerful this can become when you start to deal with procedural modeling just another way for you to modify the attributes on a per point basis using the point stop node. All right, so let's get rid of those guys. Let's put this back to default. So the other thing we can do is we can also <coughs> start to add color to this. So if I put in maybe like a red, let's actually increase the color here. And what we want to do is we want to say add color, right? And we want to give it a custom color now. So you can see how the color is changing over here on the line. It's kind of subtle. Let's make it just a nice red. There we go. All right, so we can start to give it an actual color. Now, the way that we can start to actually store data, all right, for a procedural level, is we can start to utilize some of these built-in variables. So um, as we saw with the copy node, let's actually put in the point number here. So I'm going to say $PT. And what we get is a gradated value. So you see how it's kind of not so green right there. And then all of a sudden, it's really green up here. And that's just because we're going all the way up to six. So we've overloaded that color value. All right, so one thing we can do to get this to be a really nice gradient over the whole line is actually divide that by the number of points. So the dollar $PT value is the current point, all right? That's giving us zero, one, two, three, four 
But then if I divide that by the dollar uh, n pt, like so, you'll notice that we get this nice gradient over the whole line. Because what I'm doing is I'm taking the current point and dividing that by the total number of points and ending up with a normalized value. Alrighty. So that's one way we could do it. We can also store the, let's remove this. So we can also store the actual y position. So we can actually just take that dollar $ty, so dollar $ty, and feed that into the green. And you'll notice we get that same <coughs> value right there. And we can do that for all of these, basically, say dollar $tx. And if we actually put back in our expression over here, so we're going to take the power of dollar $pt, or the point number, to a power of 3. <coughs> You'll start to see that, um, and let's remove the, the green from here. And we'll put this expression in here as well. You can start to see we can colorize our model based off of position um, uh, in the scene. We can do it based off a of point number in the scene. We can really get a lot of great um, feedback in this case. Uh, to allow us to store this procedural data and then use it later on in our graphs. All right. So again, I can do dollar $pt, divide that by the NPT, and get a nice gradient for that. All right. So then uh, the next thing that we're concerned with is the normal. So normals are always a big um, factor when you start to do a lot of copying of objects. The normals can dr drive how the objects get copied and basically their orientations and where they point, okay? So currently, if we turn on the normals for this particular line, we don't get anything. So the normal display being this little guy right here. All right, and so what we want to do is we want to add a new normal. And let's say I want to add a normal in the positive x direction. So I'm just going to hit 1, and you notice now we get these little lines shooting out of the particular line. Now what we've done is we've added the normal. So we can actually make these diagonal by adding one. All right. And we can make them point in any direction that we want. Or get rid of the normal altogether. So we add a normal maybe in Z. There you go. And that's how we do that. All right. So the last thing I wanted to do is actually show you um, how you can display or start to um, debug your data or the values that are stored in points, as that's very important uh, when you start to build more complex objects. You want to be able to see what the values that you're, are, you're actually applying, your custom values that you're actually applying to the points in your geometry. So this is where the details view comes into play. All right. And uh, what we want to do is we want to actually split this whole view in half. So what we can do is we can come up to the topmost uh, toolbar up here for this particular scene view window. All right. And what I want to do is uh, split it top and bottom, just like that. All right. And you see that it duplicates that scene view. But what I'm looking for is actually the details view. So if you right click on any of these tabs up here, you can actually switch them to a different type of view. So I'm going to right click, hold, and I'm looking for the details view. All right, <clears throat> so now what we want is we want to look at all the different numbers. So you notice here in this detail view, we're getting a uh, really um, detailed view of all the information um, on this particular geometry, okay? And it'll change based off of the selection that you currently got selected, okay? And so what's, what we can do, you'll notice that we have five points. We have five points in our particular line. All right, so for each point, we can actually go through and read the different values that we're getting for all this stuff. So you'll notice that we've added a color, right, to this particular line, and that color is being represented as 0, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, all the way up to um, the final red. So that's how we're, being, we're able to create a nice gradient over the whole line. You can also see that our normal that we created by pointing it in the Z direction is also all one in the Z direction over here. And then we can also get all those point positions in the Y direction. So utilizing this uh, details view allows us to look into our mesh or look into our geometry, points, lines, 
um, it allows us to see what kind of data we've applied. All right. And with that, uh, that concludes uh, lesson four. Thanks so much. <laughs>